Hello, welcome, or welcome back, whichever the case may be, Microsoft Virtual Academy. This time, Security Fundamentals, uh, Module 4, Understanding Network Security. Christopher, I'm here with Christopher Chapman. I am Thomas Willingham, and we are here to help our audience. I'm just here to silently stare in awe and wonder. Make things awkward? Yes. <laughs> that is my role. Uh, so we're here to understand network security further, more. Well, we're here to help better. them understand it. Well, yes, yes. I mean, I'm hoping I mean, maybe we can understand it more afterwards, but I'm hoping there's not too much of, oh, that's how that works. <laughs> By the way, not a good thing to do in a class full of people when you're teaching something. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. I didn't even know Whoa, it did I, I didn't know it oh, did that. That's crazy. <clears throat> might, might lose a little bit of credibility. Just a smidge. A little. Depending on the importance of the feature. And... Exactly, exactly. Module overview, we're going to talk about firewalls, network access protection, network isolation, protocol security, and wireless network security. So first of all, firewalls. Firewalls protect a computer, a network, or a network segment from network-based attacks. It performs filtering of data packets traversing the network and can basically filter out different kinds of content. Different types of firewalls will filter out different kinds of content. The graphic here gives you an idea of how it might work. So you have the internet, the internet traffic hits that firewall. That brick wall in diagrams is a pretty typical icon used for a firewall. Uh, notice after that that the traffic has gone way down. So just a lot of stuff that the firewall might filter out. It might filter out web traffic. It might filter out uh, telnet traffic, uh, email traffic. It can filter out a variety of traffic to hit your corporate network. So the OSI model. If you took the or watched the Networking Fundamentals course, you should be familiar with the OSI model. The OSI model, Open Systems Interconnect model, is a model that enables networked devices to intercommunicate. There are seven layers within the OSI model. Application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. Now, the, the next couple of slides here go through all of these layers. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time going through them individually. It's not that pertinent to the security course, the security exam. Uh, not to say it's not pertinent to security knowledge at some point in your career or as you advance through security, you may get to the point that the individual layers of the OSI model make a big difference. They typically don't. I mean, we're, we're not worried about security from an individual OSI model layer standpoint. At least I've never been. Uh, so the next couple of slides have this information. We're going to breeze through them pretty quick, but this deck is attached to this video in MVA, so you can grab it, take a look at it, read more about it if you want to. So. Just a little preface, a little warning there that we're going to go right through this really fast. Right. So we're basically just going to take each layer of the OSI model, very quickly review it, and continue on. So layer 7 of the OSI model is the application layer. It receives data from the user and passes it to lower layers in the OSI model. As responses come back up, it presents that information to the user. The presentation layer, layer 6, converts application layer data into a format that permits the data to be transmitted across the network. At this level, there may be a bit of encryption of the data for transmission and decryption of responses. Again, if you want to know more information about the OSI model, please look up the OSI model in the Networking Fundamentals course. The session layer. This is responsible for data synchronization between applications on the devices. The session layer establishes, manages, and breaks sessions between devices. The transport layer provides a mechanism for transferring or carrying data across the network. Uses three main me mechanisms, segmentation, so the breaking apart of messages, service addressing, so ensuring that the address on one side is speaking to the appropriate address on the other side, and then error checking, ensuring that the packet uh, traverses the network without errors being introduced. Layer 3, network layer, is responsible for routing, so transferring across networking segments. 
Layer two, the data link layer, connects the data link to the physical layer so the data can be transmitted across the physical network. It can handle error detection, error correction, and hardware addressing. And the data link layer is actually broken up into two sub-layers, the Media Access Control or MAC sub-layer and the Logical Link Control LLC sub-layer. And then the physical layer is the actual, layer one, is the actual physical topology of the network. Ethernet, token ring, fiber. So basic, basically, said it again. Not so, that much though. That's I, I'm reduction. trying to, like I said, trying to wean it out. Uh, so it defines the physical characteristics of the network media. The OSI model data flow. So this shows you how a packet at the top of the model here. So basically, it's not what I wanted. I want that. Here we go. So something at the top of the model here. So as it enters the top of the model, we have the packet and the data. And as it translates or transfers down the model, each layer adds its own component to the model. Then it gets transferred across the network. And then as it goes back up the model, that information is stripped off until we're back to just the data. Packet filtering firewall. This is the first generation firewall. The specs packets at layer three, the networking layer, based on rules that define what types of packets are allowed or denied to cross the firewall. Very simple, straightforward packet filtering. Circuit level firewall. Second generation firewall, similar to packet filtering, but operates at layers four and five. It analyzes data at the session layer. So once a session is established between two devices, all packets for that same session are allowed. So once a client and a server have established communication, then it allows all of that communication to go through. This is fine, except for say maybe a man in the middle of it tack. And what this refers to is you have two end devices. You have a device that injects in between and starts intercepting. If it's intercepting data and, and putting on different packets in between to intercommunicate, this le level of filtering or firewall may or may not catch this type of problem. Application level firewall, so third generation firewall, analyzes data and application behavior at la layer seven, also referred to as proxy servers. So again, just a little bit higher level, takes a little bit more processing power and in, is a little bit more involved. So in the and, next- And to keep it simple, our last, our last bullet. The last bullet. Most modern firewall products work as a mix of all three generations. So, and that's, so you hear about devices, a switch, a router, a bridge, uh, a firewall. And it used to be that all these devices were very specific. This is a bridge device. This is a router device. This is a switch device. This is a firewall. Now, it's not uncommon that one single device will have multiple functionality. It will act as a firewall. It will act as a switch. It will act as a router. So as you look at devices, uh, ensure that as you're looking at devices that you're comparing apples to apples. Uh, you may see one device that's priced X. Let's just, I, I'm not, picking any specific device, but let's say we have one device that's $100, and we look at an another device and it's $1,000, and they both say that they're routers. Well, maybe the $100 router is just a router, and the $1,000 router is not only a router, it's a switch, it's a firewall. So really look at the products and dig into what they have in them so to ensure that you're comparing apples to apples. 
So host firewall and network firewall, so as devices are intercommunicating here, the host firewall, this software protecting your computer from network-based attacks, also known as a personal firewall. So a host or your individual client computer versus a network firewall. The network firewall is a firewall for a network segment that, ha that basically moderates network traffic. So host, let's, let's step back for a second and think about the fact that all network traffic travels all over the network. Uh, once a device puts something on the network, it goes to all devices on the network. A host or client firewall filters out stuff that's not meant for that client or that's not pertinent for that client. So if my client isn't a uh, web server, it doesn't host RDP sessions, uh, it doesn't host email, you can shut those ports down and have those firewalls block that to ensure that back to nefarious or malicious, that those packets aren't coming in that your system might try and process that could cause problems. Versus a network firewall, a network firewall protects a network segment. And now we have, oh, it's demo time. Demo uh -oh. time of the networking or the Windows firewall. Alrighty, well, so, let me get that spun up here real quick. And what we have here is a fun adventure because, well, I'll show you, because why not? Get logged in, close our group policy, and we're just gonna start from a clean desktop. And here we have our folders from earlier. We've got the same demos, I'm running on the same machine. And we're gonna jump right into the firewall. A lot of users on desktop computers, laptops, maybe a Surface, might be familiar with one of these options. I'm gonna start. Now again, this is 2012. This may look a little different than 2008 or 2003 if you're using those. But we're going to the same destination. We're gonna to go to the control panel. This should look familiar. Firewall, eh, still not in here. I'm gonna change this to small icons because it's just my preference. Now there is Windows Firewall. This, relatively straightforward, connected. It shows you your different profiles and your connections. I can allow an app or feature through the Windows Firewall. Now, I can sort of speak to this. I'm not a big wizard fan. I don't like wizards doing the work for me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in and figure it out and change it at its root kind of a fan. I'm not gonna go that far because it's all buried inside of, I wanna say group policy. It's actually buried in the registry that these things are kept on local machines. We're not going to that level. But here, I have options that already exist. Windows services, Windows roles, different Windows communications mechanisms, and I can allow these via the checkboxes through different profiles, domain, private, or public, depending on what I'm connected to. Now, I can allow another app. This is the part where I'm not a huge fan because it kind of limits my ability to configure. Yes, this will work. I can allow applications as long as they show up in this list, which not all applications do, or I can browse to them, which most applications I can get to this way, it's gonna work, and I can allow them through the firewall. I'm a little bit more, I wanna say fundamental. I don't know if that's the right word, but we're gonna go with that. And we've seen the Windows Firewall, this is your list, and the Allow Another App is how you allow an application. And then Network Types, you can select which ones are yes and no. I like to be a little bit more granular. So we're gonna close this. We're gonna go back to Control Panel, but we're gonna go one level deeper into Administrative Tools. And all the way down here, hiding at the bottom, Windows Firewall with Advanced Security. This exists on all Windows computers past, I want to say, Vista. I, I don't remember if Vista had that or if it's just Windows 7 and later. But this exists, servers and clients. This is my kind of configuration tool. Inbound rules. Yeah, this is where I get to really strut my geek right here in this course. I like this. This is my kind of an interface. And most of it is because I have more options. This is just what is and isn't existing. These are created. Green is enabled. Gray is disabled. They exist, but they're turned off. And then all these options, which profiles are attached to, whether it's enabled, what action, because I can specify specifically allow or block 
override which program it is if there's a program associated. Local remote addresses if we're keeping it specific. Ports if I want to go with that. All of this is in this table, but we're going to create one so you can actually see how you build it. This right here, I already like this more than the other firewall because it's giving me these options. Yes, I can allow a program like I did in the other, in just the Windows Firewall Control Panel app, but I can also go per port if I don't want to tie it to a particular program. I may have, you know, for an example, I may have an email server that I have a number of applications listening on a given port or it, it depends. It depends on the setup of your network. Um, and I don't want just a program. I want to allow everything on that port so I can do that. Or I can do predefined. And these are services and roles that Windows provides as a Windows server. Or I can go custom. I'm not going to worry about custom because this is it's a lot of information, although port should have some of those. TCP or UDP, all or specific. Now, you can't do both at the same time. So if you were to want to allow a port that needs TCP and UDP, there are programs out there that need access to a port on both of those protocols. You'd have to create two rules. But again, it's granularity. I'm okay with granularity. And then you give it a port. Let's say 80. I don't mind opening a web port on this isolated non-network connected VM. Allow. Allow if it is secure, and this is IPsec based. We're not going to get into this. Uh, this is a security topic and a terrific security topic, but it's a more advanced security topic. So this is going to be covered in the, the MCSA core series, the 410, 411, 412. Or I can block it. I can flat out say, do not allow this. Now, typically, a, what's the word I'm looking for? A lack of a rule is a block. If I'm not explicitly allowing it, it's not allowed. But there may be, let's say there's a program that I'm allowing. That program may communicate on multiple ports, but I don't want it to communicate on, in this case, port 80. So I'm blocking port 80. Now that may interrupt the communication or the functionality of that program. But again, I don't use program rules very often in the firewall. I'm going per port to make sure I know what's going on. Allow is the easy option. Profile, do we want it to apply to all? No, if this is connected to a public network, if I'm in an airport, we'll, we'll visualize it. instead of a domain controller, this is my laptop or even my desktop at home. If for some reason it detects it's not connected to my home network, maybe I've taken it somewhere else. I hate to go here, but anybody watching this may have participated in a LAN party from time to time. Yeah. And if I take my desktop, which I do run a domain at home, because again, we're, we're strutting the geek right now. If I take that desktop away from my house and I'm no longer connected to my domain, I'm going to plug it in somewhere else, it's going to come up as public. I don't necessarily want all my friends browsing content on my computer. So I can uncheck this box as I'm blocking these ports and then give it a name. I don't have anything more creative right now because it's just an example. Done. Now in this list, port 80. And done. And that's, uh, that's the more complicated Windows Firewall. And that's pretty much it. That's the two of them. You can modify anything that exists. Core networking. You want to change this? You can. Now this one, because it's, you'll notice this is all grayed out. It's because of the fact this is based on the system. This, these are all pre-built rules, again, that may have different configuration options that limit what you can do in here. Um, there are other reasons for this. I can, to some degree, control firewalls with group policy. I may have rules in here that I either can't control or can control, but will suddenly revert after a certain period of time. So all those things apply. I'm trying to keep it as light as I can. I think that's good on the firewall. So one in control panel right here, and one one level deeper in administrative tools right here. And again, those were firewalls for a client, not a network segment. Although the network segment will have similar functionality. Well, it depends. The, the concepts can be the same. Blocking, it, enabling uh, applications, protocols, ports, yep. or disabling. Yep. And technically, since you can use a Windows server as a router using routing remote access services, I could end up in an interface very similar to that to actually control the flow of network traffic across segments. Not a likely scenario, but it's possible. 
Okay, so network access protection, sometimes referred to as NAP. What this does is as a computer boots up, before it even really connects to the network or as it's connecting to the network, this can analyze health of a computer, decides whether the computer can connect to network resources or not, and then may allow some sort of remediation to occur. So a computer gets booted up, uh, it goes through the, the rule checking, does it meet criteria, does it not meet criteria, if it meets criteria it connects to the network, if it doesn't meet criteria you can set it up where it gets sent to an area for remediation to enable it to come back into compliance. So this shows you what NAP architecture may look like. Uh, we have our Active Directory here, our internal network, uh, our perimeter network, internet, VPN server. So as the system boots up, it may not meet the requirements to get on the internal network, so it gets sent to the remediation network with uh, WSUS and antivirus ser servers that enable it to become back into compliance. So we have a client with limited access. It then has the ability to come into compliance from those servers. We have a NAP client once it meets compliance, able to access the internal network. Again, this is levels of security within the system because if you have a computer that boots up and is infected, uh, it doesn't meet compliance somehow, it can wreak havoc on the network. What this does is as the system comes up, it says, you know, I'm not even going to let you on the network because you're not in compliance and push it off to another network. NAP enforcement, there's IPsec enforcement, 802.1x enforcement, VPN enforcement, and DHCP enforcement. So there's different levels of enforcement using the system. Network isolation, basically with VLANs enabling a computer to be isolated from the rest of the system, disabling it or disallowing it to communicate with those other systems until it comes back into compliance. A virtual network, virtual LAN, separated logical networks managed by a single physical switch. Uh, switches provide connectivity at layer 2, so the data link layer. Switch traffic is faster than router traffic and can be used for isolation. So when you look at VLANs, they actually run on the same physical hardware. So the computer Christopher and the computer I am working on could be on the same physical network, but divided by VLANs, virtual networks, at which point that even though we're on the same virt or physical network, we still not, might not be able to intercommunicate. Routing, routing connects different network segments. It's provided at layer three, analyzes destination and source packets, and then decides how to get the packet from basically its origin to its destination. <clears throat> excuse me, it uses a routing table to decide this option. So think of like a map, you have a map to get from point A to point B, the routing system is the one that looks at the map and says, oh, okay, how am I gonna get from point A to point B using whatever method that the router is set up to use? So this routing slide here shows you how data can be sent from one router to another. And what would happen if one network segment goes down? Let's actually kind of do that again here. That was kind of slick. So we have data here being sent across the network from the client to another client. Here we see in the second example one of the network segments down, and yet they can still intercommunicate using a different channel. IDS and IPS, these are security technologies. Intrusion detection systems, IDS, 
and Intrusion Prevention Systems, IPS. An IDS system is a solution designed to detect unauthorized user activities, attacks, and network compromises. Is the device being accessed inappropriately? If so, it's detected and basically the oh no's are sent up, oh no's, uh, somebody's informed, they can take appropriate steps. An intrusion prevention system is similar to IDS, except that in addition to detecting and alerting, IPS can t also take action to prevent a breach from occurring. So, uh, specific, <clears throat> excuse me, a specific type of issue is occurring, IPS can actually take steps to mitigate the possible problems. Honeypots. A honeypot is a trap for hackers. It's designed to be a system on your network that hackers can access that you can start to collect data on. So you have this system that you're not overly concerned, well, you're not concerned about the data on it at all. And as you see somebody attack the system, you can evaluate how they've attacked it and use that information to better secure other devices on your network. A honey net is basically a series of honey pots on a network that creates a more realistic attack environment. A perimeter network, you may in the field also refer to this as a DMZ. Perimeter network is an isolated network, serves as a, basically a buffer between two networks, often used between the public network and a corporate environment can be implemented using one or two firewalls. If you look at the next slide here, you see this kind of sandwich perimeter network where it's between multiple firewalls. So, let's see here. Basically, we have this firewall here in between the internet and the rest of the system. Then we have a firewall here between the web server, the mail server, and DNS, and then a firewall here between the corporate network. So traffic is going to come in here, hit the firewall, be able to come over here and gain access here, and then these users can come over here and gain access to web mail, the server, whatever they need information to. This is an example of a single perimeter network. Let's just go back really quick. So here's a dual firewall here. Here's a single firewall. So we have a single firewall that provides a similar function. And now we're back to demo time. Uh, this is a demo about routing. Oh, is it? Yes. Routing. Routing. Well, what I will do, because again, you you hear the you hear the word routing. We've talked about routers. We've talked about firewalls. We've talked about traffic in and out. Routing is a complex. Well, it's like security. There are people who, whose entire jobs is routing. You guys have heard of Cisco, right? Everybody, I assume you've heard of Cisco once or twice. You guys, the the I, I'm talking to the guys back in the back here. We're not, supposed to, we're not supposed to talk about them. We all know Cisco. Never heard of them. Never, never heard of them. So what I am going to show you is, well, well let's, let's dive into a little bit of server fundamentals here. I'm going to open up Server Manager. This, again, is 2012. This may look a little bit different than what you've got. But the idea is the same. We're going to add some roles and features. Add roles and features. Role-based installation. That's the computer we want. All the way down here. Let me see what all this installs. Make sure we're good. I'm not gonna worry about the add-ons that we normally give. So, and something you'll notice, this is another change in Server 2012. This is just remote access. It's not routing and remote access like it used to be. You may have noticed that. 
but it is still routing. Next, and this installs very quickly, so I don't have to worry about this taking a half an hour and I was just sitting here doing nothing. And you'll see little, little mentions. While Microsoft is very able to change a feature name and really change in the interface, that phrase, that word, that title may be documented approximately a billion places on Earth. You may see some interchangeability. Um, direct access and RSVPN into a single management console. We're not going to worry too much about that. We're just going to get this running. I'm going to turn off. Oh, let me hold off on that. Direct access and VPN I don't want. We're just worried about routing. I'm going to turn this feature off. It tells me because I'm turning that off, I can remove some of the prerequisite features that were added when I added the remote access role. No, not, but what? It doesn't want to let me do just one or the other. I can turn off routing. I can't turn off direct access and RAS without having routing. It's not going to let me do it. So next, that's fine. We're going to take the role services it gave us. We're not worried about customizing that at all. Get this up and running, and this will get done. The problem I'm going to have with this demo, I, it would take forever is the biggest problem. Setting up routes, setting up RAS servers, getting two of them to talk to each other, especially with networks behind them, a little complicated. But we're going to uh, at least take a look at the interface for using Windows as a router if you choose to do so. Um, I, I wish I could pull up a search engine and just show the dozen or two dozen or three dozen or 400 different interfaces for different types of routing solutions, whether it's software-based as Windows or hardware-based as Cisco device, any other, any other manufacturer of routers that exist out there. And another pointer, something we mentioned before when we talked about, what was the topic we were talking about? It was just a couple of minutes ago. Firewalls. Routers, by definition, do a certain thing. A lot of devices these days, whether or not they're called a router, may do some routing. And some things called routers may do other things that aren't routing. I'm not going to be nitpicky about defining each of those different things, and you're usually not going to see that on a test, on an exam, on something that is really pertinent. Just know that you're going to see a lot of overlap. Gateways, switches, routers, they all sort of share some functionality. And because of that, because everybody makes them, there are 100 different devices with 100 different interfaces, and this is the only one I can show you in a demo, is ours. So is that installed? Oh, I, did I close? Oh, good, I didn't. I thought I closed Server Manager for a second. This actually gives me the status of the install while it's happening. I don't have to sit and wait for it. Although my flag's not. Oh, good. Server Manager's hung up. Awesome. Love it when demos do that. There we go. Oh, still thinking about... There we go. So it's still installing. I can come back and check this. There we go. Succeeded. Close that. Where's the ta-da? Ta-da! I wish servers... I wish any of these tools would do that when things finished. It would say ta-da! Uh, routing remote access. So now it appears in our tools menu. And it thinks and it comes up. So in here, uh, this is one of the nice things about servers or about this particular feature of servers. You have to set up the basics before it'll even let you turn on the service. Determine what you want to do. I don't want remote access. I don't want NAT. Two private networks. This would be a site-to-site -site VPN or a custom, which is where you're, if you're purely doing routing, that's where this is going to be. LAN routing. That's it. I'm just telling it what I want to do. It's going to set up some interfaces. It's going to enable the service. It's going to take just a second, and I'll be able to get in and take a look. And hopefully it won't disconnect me. Oh, I can't. It's not. I'm not network-based, I guess, so I'm good. And we're up and running. Now, in here is where I set different interfaces. Again, we're talking about routing, so I'm probably on a server with more than one network interface card or NIC that's connecting to those multiple networks. This is where I can see what those are. I can get into some information. These ones aren't. It's all, it's all pre-built or what came with the server, basically. And in here, I can build my routes if I want to. I'm trying to explain this as best I can without going into deep explanation of routing and routing tables and multiple interfaces and how it all works and how it all goes together. For now, this is the interface you're going to see. You're going to get your server, your multiple network interfaces, your static routes if you want to build them, which if you're building this server to service two 
network segments, you're going to build a static route, so it's going to be pretty simple. New static route, destination mask, and the gateway to get to it on a given interface. And usually, again, you'll have more than one interface as determined up here. Cancel that, come up here. Uh, general, this just shows status of existing interfaces. I think that's it. There, the only other thing I'll show you in here is uh, show IP routing table. This is what's been built by the server. It already exists. And I'm only connected to one network, so it's only going to show me that one network. But I would, were I to create additional static routes, be able to see them in here. Um, I mean, I wish I had a more in-depth routing demo to do, but it's just so much information and so much depth that... It's hard to do a high-level routing demo. It, it really is. As soon as I start that, I'm like, well, I can install the feature, and I can look at the feature. But as soon as I start actually building static routes and connecting different network segments, I mean, I could even do it and show it on the screen, but it, the explanation is going to take forever. Of the house and it's, and yeah, it's going to be really confusing. But this is a way, you're looking at an interface right now that Windows Server allows you to set up a Windows Server as a router between network segments. And that's one of your options. So after routing, we talk about protocol security, multiple levels here. One level is network address translation. This is as much address expansion as it is protocol security. It's a technique used to modify the network address information of a host while traffic is transversing from a private network to a public network. Techniques used to hide information of a private network can be. Uh, NAT was used as a workaround for the IP address shortage for IPv4. So there were so many IP, only so many IPv4 addresses. From that pool, uh, public facing addresses became smaller. So they introduced NAT as a method to have one public facing IP address for your corporate system or your home based network. From that single address, you could put the NAT device facing internally, that NAT device manages all the addresses internally and allows your internal devices to be external facing. Two types of NAT, static and dynamic, they're pretty much what they say. Static NAT is the ability to explicitly give an address to an internal device. Dynamic makes it like DHCP in the fact that a dynamic address is given. DHCP, I basically threw that term out but didn't define it, dynamic host configuration protocol. If you want to know more about that, again, back to networking fundamentals. I was, I was just about to chime in and say, actually, we have a place to learn more about all those. But yeah, it's terrific. Virtual private network. If you are on a public facing network, the internet, and you need access to company resources, a VPN can be one method that allows you to do this. We talked about tunneling as a method, one, one method of encryption. So you have your client server communication over the internet. VPN creates a special encrypted channel between the devices that allows those two devices to intercommunicate without other devices being able to look in and see what those sessions look like. IPsec, Internet Protocol Security, standards-based protocol suite designed for securing uh, internet protocol communications. It's also a component of IPv6, next generation IP protocol, authenticates and encrypts each IP packet in an IP data stream. So we mentioned that IPsec briefly in the, what was I looking at? I was doing a demo, the firewall demo. Firewall demo. You can do the there's the allow on the block, and there's allow when secured, and that's an IPsec feature. And IPsec operates at the network layer, the OSI model. Secure socket layers, SSL. This enables secure communications with web services. And? Uh, oh, key VPN protocol used today yep. is SSL TLS. 
Yeah, uh, main alternative to IPsec for implementing a VPN solution. Yeah, a couple of years ago, SSL and TLS became sort of the the preferred method for VPNs. Some VPNs over the older PPTP, L2TP. It's just an easier to implement solution for VPNing. Secure shell. So there's the ability to, from one system, create a session to another system, and the secure shell protocol is a protocol to create a secure channel to enable this communication. Uh, it says for secure remote login and other secure network services over the network. Can be used for a number of applications across multiple platforms, including Unix, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Tunneling, we've talked a little bit about tunneling when we talked about IPsec and VPNs. Encapsulation of one network protocol within another. Tunneling can be used to route an unsupported protocol across a network or securely route traffic across an insecure network. You, VPNs use a form of tunneling when data is encapsulated in the IPsec protocol. And as Christopher mentioned, he just mentioned point-to-point -point protocol and layer two tunneling protocol with IPsec. DNS security extensions, DNSSEC, adds security provisions to DNS so computers can verify that they've been directed to proper servers. Let's step back really quick and think of a scenario where, uh, so DNS, let's define DNS really quick. As users, we use names, uh, Microsoft.com, um, NFL.com, Seahawks.com, uh, Bing.com. So we use those to gain access to a web server. DNS is a system that translates that username to an IP address, which is what the internet is based off of. So now let's go back to our scenario. Scenario, I as a user try to go to Microsoft.com. I somehow gain access to a malicious DNS server. So instead of redirecting me to Microsoft.com, it redirects me to another malicious site with nefarious intent. There's a lot of that insecurity. There could, yes. A lot yes. of nefarious intent going on. There, yes, yeah, and that's what we're trying to mitigate, is we're trying to mitigate malicious and nefarious activity. We need to add a keyword counter to these things so that as we use the words that have come up, we get little numbers on the screen. Bing, keyword count five for today. Yep, I think the keyword for today is nefarious. I think nefarious is good. I like and then it. mitigate, which was actually in the, in the content. Yes, it is. Uh, so DNS security extensions creates a more reliable intercommunication system between a client and a DNS server. Provides authentication and integrity checking on DNS lookups, ensuring that outgoing internet traffic is always sent to the correct server. This allows or enables the removal of issues of forged DNS data, as I just mentioned. Network sniffing, we talked about the fact that a network sniffer can be used for good or it can be used for bad, depending on what you're doing with it. You can use it to trace information on your network. Uh, what does your network traffic look like? What are the different levels? Uh, what's your throughput? Do you have snags? Do you have bottlenecks? It can also be used to recreate sessions. So it's funny, did we see this at any other point in this course? Yeah, we've talked about network sniffing. So where did we talk about it before? Uh, we talked about it, where did we talk about parts it? Parts of types of attacks. Oh, there we go, yes, parts of attacks. So this is one of the fun things about IT, and especially about security in IT. One of the things I greatly enjoy, things that you don't want on your network, things you don't want people to have or be using or see or have to deal with, you may have and see and use and deal with on a daily basis. It is entirely possible. This is a terrible tool that could be used to completely break our network. I want to go run it real quick on my desktop because I need to see some network traffic. Yeah, from... I'll, I'll be right back. i yeah, got to go run exactly. this. So it, it comes down to intent. It what does. is the intent of the tool? Uh, are you using the tool for good? Or are you using the tool for bad? 
that is up to you. And we're trying to give you the knowledge that if the tool is used for bad or if these are used for bad, to, to give you some ideas of what you might use or at least some resources to go hit to take a look at what you can do to mitigate. And that brings us to common attacks. Things like denial of service, distributed denial of service, so DOS or DDoS attacks, uh, IP spoofing to bypass network security, man in the middle attacks, which we talked a little bit about, mm -hmm. backdoor attacks, so using unsecured ports to access your system, DNS poisoning, so getting bad uh, DNS information out there and causing inappropriate redirection. Mm -hmm. uh, replay attack, so after a certain string has been or a certain set of data has been sent, basically resending it multiple times. W weak encryption keys, so breaking encryption, or social engineering, which we talked about earlier. Still, that one should be the top, still my favorite. Common attacks, password cracking, dictionary attack, Bruce, brute force attacks, software vulnerability, buffer overflow, remote code execution, SQL injection, cross-site scripting. Oh. These are all, like, we could spend a day just on these common attacks. We could spend a week on these gonna, common I attacks. I know developers that you talk about software vulnerability and buffer overflows and remote code execution in weeks. 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 Uh, these, are, these are actually really, really interesting uh, topics. And if you're interested, I would say dig into them further. At this point, we're, we're just barely scratching the surface. But we're trying to make you aware of these issues so you have the ability to go and research further. Well, on some of these, on this page, the first three, password cracking, dictionary attack, and brute force attack, those are the things that are going to be covered potentially in an objective domain for security fundamentals. This is not a developer-oriented course. This is an infrastructure-oriented course. So the, the second half of this page, software vulnerability down, remote code, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, you're not going to see in this content or in the any subsequent exams or any of that any of that material. So they're good to know about. Absolutely learn about them. They'll they'll make you able to annoy the heck out of any developers you have that are friends or coworkers, which is terrific. But for the sake of this, the first three are the big ones and the previous page. Wireless network security. So now we'll talk about securing your wireless environments to enable secure communication. And this is where we get tricky. So I talked earlier about users having their own devices. This is where it gets a little complicated because I have a phone in my pocket. I walk into work, we've got wireless networks everywhere. Can I connect to those wireless networks? Well, I connect to them on my laptop, just username and password. I can do the same thing on my phone. That means that potentially anyone could connect to that wireless network. Anyone who can get within this building's range. Obviously, in our case, we need a username and password. That's our security. We'll talk more about additional security, but this is one of the biggest topics in IT right now only because of the proliferation of personal devices, the proliferation of wireless networks at home and at work, knowing the right options to set them up and such. So I'm just emphasizing the importance of wireless network security. WEP was the first security available to, to uh, wide area network users. Right. Uh, rapidly fell out of favor. That, yeah, it's kind of sad. Why? Why fell did it fall out of favor? Fell out of favor when a flaw in the encryption was found. Aww. There are videos for anybody curious who wants to learn about security from a purely academic but educated standpoint, uh, there are videos available that show you how easy it is to crack web. I won't direct you to them, but they do exist. Yeah, and, and that kind of stuff, to understand these attacks, you need to ha have an understanding of them and how they're performed. That, that's why uh, black hat type conferences are so popular because for security professionals to truly be a security professional, the best security professionals, honestly, are the best hackers. That's true. Because they understand the mindset, uh, and, and they kind of come from the background of just little curious Georges. I just want to know more. I want to know how to dig into that. Uh, I want to know what makes it tick. And kind of by getting into that, by digging into that, you find security holes. 
WPA2 and WPA or WPA and WPA2 Wi-Fi protected access uh, was designed as an interim successor to WEP. Uh, included a new security pro protocol, uh, TKIP, Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. And then WPA2 is a standard-based version of WPA, uh, except WPA2 implements all of the IEEE 802.11i standards. Hence the interim. The first one was interim because they were working on that standard, the 802.11i standard, and the full implementation of it. Very similar to... Well, what they did with uh, 802.11n, which is merely a speed, a bandwidth protocol, was they actually started releasing devices for it before the protocol had been finalized and called them draft. You could actually get yes. devices that said draft on the box. It was crazy. It's kind of weird for me to see. We're at the end already. Are we? Yeah, we oh, are. That's the end. All right, well. Uh, Microsoft.com slash learning for yep. resources, objective domain, uh, additional resources, Christopher? Lots of courses, lots of exams, the rest of the MTA track. You've started to see in this one, kind of we talked about the prerequisites, you can see how we've structured that. There are networking pieces in here, things we covered in the networking fundamentals course, that if you have that one, makes this one a little easier to take. If you're already through the fourth module of this one, you may just want to finish it out and then go back and watch the networking one. Maybe take this one again, see, see if there are some differences. Uh, other than that, yeah. Go and, take and the exam, notice get ready, take some courses. There have been a couple things when we talked about OSI, uh, when we talked about some of the protocols, VPN, IPsec, uh, PP2, TP, yep. and Layer 2 uh, telling protocol. We've covered that in a, a bit more in depth in the Networking Fundamentals yep. course. And then you'll cover them more in depth in the MCSA courses beyond that. Uh, I don't, know. I don't know. We're being flashed information on the screen, and <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh, that's so terrific. Th this actually is awesome. Uh, we do have a counter. Nefarious is three, basic is four, demos 12, break times four, hacker is six. I like, I like, it's good. Yeah. I think it's basic though, not basically, so our, our producers are, are doing some good things for us back in the back so here. So we're only as good as the people behind the scenes and we have some damn fine people. That's what we Can got I right say there. damn fine? I think so. Okay. I don't, I don't okay. have any reasons that we can't. Yeah, there we go. Damn fine. So. There you go. I said it. So we'll be back.